You're listening to the Teach Better Talk podcast featuring expert educators eager to share progressive tactics to reach more students. Teach Better Talk is created by teachers and fueled by passion. Let's get started. Welcome to episode 270 of Teach Better Talk. My name is Ray Hewitt. Jeff Gargis is here. And are we going to be able to get through this intro without Jeff making fun of me? We're taking a poll. Hands? Anybody? Hands? Are you watching on YouTube? Hands up? Up? Oh, okay. I'm just, I'm just over here breathing. No. Just breathing. You're being mean to me, Jeff. It's I fine. I am not. I'm, up I'm my intro, breathing. I messed I, it up. I did not mess up your intro. Did I? Oh, I it's guess true. I did. No, you're right. I did. You messed up. So then I, I messed guys, it up. Yes. Guys. I started welcoming you into the show and Jeff Cargis burst out laughing, <laughs> which means we had to restart. Now, to be fair, I burst out laughing because the first time you welcome us into the show, you didn't know what episode it was. Now, to be fair to you, we had to reverse the way that we recorded these uh, intros. So I get it. Like you were on. So you said, the right the thing, ep- though. you said the right episode, right? 283. No, it's 270, Jeff. <laughs> but here's the thing. Guys, do you even care what episode number it is? Let's no. be completely honest. Like, they, I could have been they, like, welcome to episode 349. <laughs> no one would have like, been oh, like, it seems a little off, but they're probably right or wrong. Uh, no, because you're already playing. It's, you know, you're, you're, you're in your car. Uh, you're, you're working out. If you're working out, go, go, go. That's awesome. But you're just hanging out and walking the dogs, whatever you're doing. What are you, what's this face looking? What are you doing? They might be watching us on YouTube. Who would want to watch this? I mean, I understand one part of the screen isn't nearly <laughs> as attractive as the other. But... Oh, man. We should just make both sides of the screen you for the rest. <laughs> oh, that would be creepy. <laughs> anyway, be creepy. what are we... Weren't we going to highlight something and we're then go into... Something. We're going to highlight the fact... And just, and more, not, uh, a highlight, just a, a friendly reminder, maybe, um, of a, a change that's happened recently, and that is a shift in our mastery chat that is no longer mastery chat. Our Thursday dun, night dun, Twitter dun. chat that uh, a while, you know, a, over a month ago now, we, we've been using both hashtags, hashtag teach better and then hashtag mastery chat because we've shifted to hashtag teach better. Uh, so we're still using both hashtags. However, back on May 20th, we made the shift to the new format, which is a 30 minute format with four questions and then a 30 minute recap right after. And that was a big change for us. It's been really, really well received. People like it because we kind of took a, a 90 minute experience, now made it 60. Uh, I love the fact that the four questions makes our moderators like pick the four best questions. So we used to do yeah. seven. So just a friendly reminder to join us on Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern every single Thursday using hashtag teach better. And then right after that at 8.30 Eastern, is the recap. We typically have a moderator on with us. We kind of got to dive into like what they were thinking, what they're hoping to get out of the chat. We asked some of them their, their own questions live. It's a good time. So join us. Well, and I just think like to me, it's like getting the lesson and then getting the enrichment. Like come join the conversation. Mm. It's real good. Real yes. good. I love it. You can get more info over at teachbetter.com. So go check that out. All right, let's let's get into this episode. This is a great episode. Uh, Terrell Strayhorn is just a dynamite guest. We had a great talk uh, time talking. He has some great stories, some amazing insights. Listen all the way through. I'm gonna let him break down all the things that he does because he does a lot of stuff. So I'm not gonna do do it justice. So I'm gonna let Terrell do that. So I just want to get right into it. Let's get into episode 270 with Terrell Strayhorn. Hey guys, we'll get right back to this episode, but do not forget, we just did a huge shift for our Twitter chat that used to be hashtag mastery chat every single Thursday. We now are changing mastery chat to hashtag teach better chat. Now this chat is the exact same time. It has always been eight o'clock Eastern over on Twitter. But during this chat, rather than having an hour long conversation, we are changing it up. We are doing a half an hour conversation and then a half an hour live recap with the host. If you are not familiar with Twitter chats, don't be nervous. This is a great one to start with. Meet us over on Twitter every single Thursday at 8 o'clock Eastern for a wonderful 30-minute chat with then a 30-minute live recap with the host and a member of the Teach Better team. We'll see you there. All right, let's get back to this episode. All right, we are here. We are chatting with Terrell Strayhorn. And Terrell, it is awesome to have you on the podcast. Super excited to dive in and learn more about you, get into your story, 
hear about all the things you have going on. Before we get too far into things, how are you feeling right now? Well, hello, Jeff. I'm feeling good. Actually, um, had a very full day, productive day, but that is always the case. And so looking forward to having a conversation with you about, um, you know, one, education and teaching and, and have an opportunity to just talk about really important matters in ways that I hope will enrich people's lives. So excited, ready. Oh, I can already tell this is going to be a good episode here, people. You know, before we get too far into this, I know we have a bunch of questions we're going to throw your way. Would you mind kind of answering a little bit about your background and all that you do? How do you describe your work? Um, so it depends on the day in a way, um, Ray. But, you know, I am Terrell Strayhorn. I'm currently provost and senior vice president of academic affairs at Virginia Union University. So in that role, I serve as the university's chief academic officer. I oversee the curriculum and supervise all of the academic programs, all of the academic deans, ultimately all faculty sort of report up to that role. Um, I also serve as the director of the Center for the Study of HBCUs. It's a national research center that's really unapologetically committed to the in um the f- academic study of the nation's 101 HBCUs in the country. Um, and we've been playing, a, I mean, it's an important role that HBCUs play, but I think it's taken on sort of heightened importance in recent months um, due to the historic election of our vice president, Kamala Harris, and many senators. So I think HBCUs have been doing a great job. And so that center really focuses on what they do and sort of economic impacts there. But that aside, um, I see myself as a person who solves problems. And, you know, um, I try to solve problems on my own campus um, I know lots of people in these leadership roles put out fires and there's some of that that I have to do. So in some ways I'm a firefighter. I remember being six years old. I wanted to be a firefighter and who knew that I would be a firefighter as a chief academic officer. Um, that's how I would do it. But, you know, I think to do leadership well, especially in educational spaces, whether it's schools or colleges, you don't want to be a firefighter. You don't want to put out fires. You want to be a smoke detector and learn how to use data and information to uh, anticipate when there will be problems and then create a plan to resolve them before they escalate. And so that's what I see myself doing um, in these roles. All right. I've, I've never heard the smoke detector uh, angle on that. I love that. That is, <laughs> that is awesome. I, I'm more like, Ray, I think we're done. I think we're good. We're going to cut it here. <laughs> Yeah, we're good. No, I really love no, that. I, I wanted love to hear more about his story, Jeff. Come on, let us get into the well, episode. So, so I, I love how you talk about how you want to be a firefighter, and that's what, and that's what you see what you're doing, but that you actually really see more of a smoke detector and stuff. That's I, I really that's really awesome. I really love that angle. Uh, I want to look back, like so. This last year, right? This last year or so has been so crazy. You know, uh, we don't we only get uh, a few of the higher education folks on here. So when we get you on here, I love digging into like what this year has been like for you and your roles and the many different roles you have. What with the pandemic and everything going on, how has that either, I mean, obviously challenged what you had to do? Um, what are the hurdles that have come in place? How has it changed maybe the way that you look at things or the way that you operate? Kind of what's this year been like from from your uh, viewpoint? That's a great question. And of course, you know, I know that we're on a timetable, but if you had like eight hours, I could tell you about every <laughs> single thing that I've experienced and all that we've gone through. But, you know, I'd summarize it this way. Um, and your question gives me the framework for doing so. First is there are some things that, um, you know, this pandemic has really um, ushered in and taught me as a teacher, as an educator, as a um, campus leader. Um, that only affirms more deeply what I thought before the pandemic. Um, there are also some things that I've experienced through this pandemic, um, that has changed my leadership in the way I think about, um, some problems. And then there's certainly some things that I had no previous script for working through the pandemic introduced it to us. And we had to create new tools, find, think outside the box. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, what we've had to do and the resilience that I think, um, you know, all of us have played. But let me then locate it in my current role as provost at Virginia Union. Um, one, the pandemic, um, you know, I've always been, I said earlier, I remember dreaming of being a firefighter. That didn't stay with me. I mean, by the time I was seven, I probably wanted to be a doctor. And by the time I was eight, I wanted to be a lawyer. So, I mean, I changed positions quite a bit. Um, but I don't change positions quite a bit, but my aspirations as a kid changed quite a bit. Um, and there was this point at which I realized that, um, whatever I did in my adult life, I wanted it to be with people. 
because I wanted to help people. My mother is a nurse, public health nurse. She's committed her career, her life to um, helping people. She was a frontline worker through this pandemic. My grandmother, who's now deceased, was a public school teacher. So I grew up in with all these people who taught me in obvious and less obvious ways that really your life is not... Um, you know, complete until you've used it in service to others, that um, your greatest uh, contribution is what you do for others. And so um, I've always had this people first orientation that was really enriched and deepened through the pandemic because as a chief academic officer, sort of second in command at my institution, I realized every single day that there is nothing I could do as a provost without other people. I don't teach the classes. I supervise the people who teach the classes. I don't deal with students on a day-to-day basis. I supervise the people who work in the counseling centers and in the advising centers who work directly with the students and their families. I don't dish out financial aid. I work with and collaborate with the people who do that. So everything I do, my bottom line is dependent on people and my team matters. And this pandemic just let me Um, It underscored the importance of people first and that as my team's lives were um, stretched and challenged and stressed by this pandemic, I had to exercise grace and understanding and be empathetic and be patient and be, um, you know, I just had to be all of those things for my team. Um, I was always... I thought to myself, I thought about myself as an empathetic person who strived to think about the world through other people's shoes. But the pandemic taught me, one, I don't know anything about their shoes. I don't know their shoe size. I don't know their shoe type. I don't know much at all because um, my life, my lens, my perspective is shaped by my own experience that, you know, I've got faculty and, and, and staff in my care who lost loved ones in their immediate family. That was not my story. Um so how do you help someone who's grieving the loss of a, of a partner or of a son or a daughter who's also trying to teach classes and be attentive in the moment with their students, but they are still distracted by mounting medical bills? And I mean, it's just the, the pandemic only um, underscored the importance of people and empathy and vulnerability um, and grace. There are also some things that the pandemic taught me that I know nothing about. I mean, I unfortunately, um, <clears throat> I've been a vice president of academic affairs before um, at another institution, but uh, I had, I, we lost a student during this pandemic to death. And so, and that student was graduating. Um, so my leadership was impacted by now having to partner with the institution to communicate this loss to the family, to, you know, in my role as chief academic officer, I supervise or oversee commencement. And so um, how do you pivot at the last minute to change the plans for commencement? Because now the student will not be there in person. You will be awarding their degree posthumously. How do you connect with the vendors in the last minute so that, you know, no one sees something on the screen that is going to be a trigger to their own grieving process? I mean, it's just so many, and I and I had no script uh, whatsoever, Jeff and Ray, to work through that. So um, you lean on each other. You um, you know think creatively and innovatively. You realize that there's power in diversity. Diversity is both you know structural diversity. You want different kinds of people, race and sexual orientation, and um, you know political affiliation. But you also need diversity of mind. I needed people who could think outside the box, who were not trapped by the box, who could reimagine the world in a circle, not a box at all. And so sometimes through this pandemic, my partners on these big questions weren't people who I would traditionally think about. I mean, I found myself, as a vice president, I always am at meetings with vice presidents. But through this pandemic, um, you know, students became my thought partners and parents became my thought partners and aunts and uncles and, you know, board members and coordinators of programs and faculty who are adjunct. They teach part time, but they could tell me what it's like as a part time faculty member teaching in a pandemic with an institution where your only point of connection has been through remote teaching. You know nothing about what that campus looks like. So it's hard to tell a student who's having a crisis in your classroom 
um, you know, your virtual classroom and they're clearly showing signs of some mental health challenges, but you've never been on campus. So you don't know where the counseling center is and you don't know about telehealth services. So all of this was new for me um, and new for us, but I'm, uh, you know, excited that we, we made it through um, and we made it through. We were able to preserve our enrollment. We were able to do the best we could to support our students and our faculty and staff. And I'm really, really optimistic about the future. Wow, there was so much in there. I mean, you, you're gone. And I'm like, oh, the whole idea of like, have you thought through all the ways that, that you can't do that you can't do your job without people? And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I, I got to talk about that. And then you mentioned the the shoes and like not knowing their shoes. And I'm like, oh, I got to talk about that. And then you went with the story, and I'm like, the pivot and the power of that story. I'm like, I'm just not going to talk about any of them because uh, that was incredible. I, I really love your reflection on this in the way that you look back on how the things that this affirmed for you, but also the things that, it, it, you know, the vulnerability that you shared just now that you also shared during this pivot with your team and stuff. That's, that's just powerful, man, that you pulled away from there. And, and I, I could tell that your team and you are so much stronger now because of that. Um, I want to go on to one of, one of my favorite questions here and something that we ask all of our guests, and that is to have you share a story with us about a time that you've had a failure and kind of, we want you to take us, take us there with you. Tell us what happened how did you overcome that failure and that setback? And what did you take away from that experience? Again, you're asking really great questions. I mean, and it's just a matter of how much time do you have? I could tell you all the failures and we'd be here until next week. Um, but I, you know, I'm looking at the, the list of questions and here's what I know. And, and I know I'm in good company for this. Anyone who listens to this episode will know that, um, you know, leadership is... Um, all in my estimation, it's all about, um, successes and failures and that every good leader has failed. And I think that I would say that most good leaders, um, understand that you're failing forward. So I tell my team all the time, like, you know, know, look, hurry up, fail and fail forward because, um, after you get through this, we'll learn something and we'll, um, experiment or innovate again and try again. And then we might find success with that or we might not, but we'll fail forward. We'll make incremental progress though through each of these failing forwards. So, um, you know, I think there are a lot of examples that I could um, offer. You know, I think the one that probably relates most to um, <clears throat> where I hope we'll get in this conversation is, uh, you know, in my, so I'm a provost, um, but I'm also a scholar, a researcher, a faculty member. That is my core identity. Um, I still conduct research. I still write um, journal articles and books. Um, I'm never going to stop. I imagine that I will retire someday and probably still be writing. Of course, that's coming from a guy who said when he was six, he wanted to be a firefighter. When he was seven, he wanted to be a doctor. So I might change. But if I don't change, right, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I love to write. And I also see writing as, um, you know, an instrument. It is my social justice. I change the world through my leadership or I strive to change the world through my leadership. One, you know, sometimes one person, one student, one policy, one program, one school at a time. Um, But I also know that I have been blessed to enact change in the world through my scholarship. There are some teachers that teach differently in the classroom because of what I wrote about teaching um, students of color. There are some campuses that I've worked with and consulted with um, who, who have a number of different belonging initiatives on their campus to foster diversity and equity and racial justice um, based on my research on belonging. And so when I, when, you know, people always say, well, why do you write so much? That energizes me. The fact that I know there are policies, programs, and signs at Kent State, at Colgate, at Amherst, at the University of Kentucky, at Penn State, um, at the University of, um, you know, California, at so many, at Sonoma State University. Um, that I was able to work with. Now, these people did not know me because look, I'm basically just a six-year-old who wanted to be a firefighter who got his doctoral degree and ended up being a provost. But it was my writing that they encountered first. And it was through the book on belonging that they brought me to their campus or the president of some campus brought me to their strategic planning retreat. And I worked with a group of leaders 
to create a plan that would create new opportunities and equity for people who show up in the world looking like all of us who are listening to this episode. So that is exciting to me. And um, I'm, and so I'm thrilled about the belonging work. But what I think people don't often, or I never get a chance to really talk about is that the success of my belonging work actually began first with the failure. And that is um, that the first idea for that book, when I pitched it to a publisher, they weren't interested. Um, they thought that the idea of, you know, my work on belonging is sim- in short that I have found through my research over the years, I'm talking research that dates back now almost a decade, which is incredible that I can say that I feel old, but, um, you know, um, through surveys and interviews and a number of different methods with students, I've learned that sense of belonging is an important ingredient in the recipe for success for students. You want students to succeed in your classroom, in your school, in your college or your university. Part of what you've got to do is foster places, spaces where they feel like they matter and they belong. And when they do, they will be successful. When they don't, they will not be successful. Um, my research, depending on which publication I'm speaking from, I have found that, you know, students who feel a sense of belonging come to class. So it's got huge implications for attendance. Um, they, they're not truant because they feel connected to their faculty, their teachers, they, their, their peers, and their whole pieces to, to that, right? Students who feel like they belong also um, do better in terms of their grades, their retention, their persistence, their graduation, they graduate at higher rates. Um, they're less likely to join gangs. They're less likely to suffer from or to um, abuse substances and drug abuse. Sense of belonging really balances out um, a lot of those experiences for students. Uh, and we And there are ways to foster belonging in the classroom, in the school, in the um, college, the university, the major, Um, there are different strategies that work for different students. It's not like one shot, um, you know, does it for everyone. Um, women require different, um, experiences and supports to find a sense of belonging than men, uh, students of color, than white students. And even there are nuances there. Black students, depending on the kinds of educational spaces they're, they're moving through, if they're predominantly white, if they're high resource, whatever, there are different strategies. And so my research over the years has really shown me um, critical insights that, listen, when you put them to practice, I have helped campuses um, increase their overall graduation rates through bel- belonging. I've witnessed and watched it work for increasing first year retention rates, that it increases, um, you know, there were more students who graduated from high school in um, in Ferguson, Missouri, same place where Michael Brown was tragically shot and killed, um, that uh, greater students, greater numbers of students graduated from high school because of the work that I did with the school district there in Ferguson, Missouri, using belonging as a lens. But I say all that to you to say this. There is a publisher who will remain unnamed, who told me when I submitted it to them the first time that the idea was too generic for it to be worth a book contract, um, that it seemed very, um, you know, touchy feely. Um, not, not scientific enough. Um, and it, you know, and of course, when I got that feedback from the first time around, I internalized it like most people do and thought of it as an indictment against myself. Um, you know, maybe I'm not a good writer. Maybe my ideas are not deep enough. Um, maybe I'm not onto something here. Uh, maybe I should trash the idea and move on to something more, you know, scientific. There's a huge part of belonging and you see it. I mean, this was what, 2008 when I first started doing my work on belonging. Um, And here it is 2021. All you got to do is go to monsterjobs.com or inside uh, or higheredjobs.com. Any of these job sites, indeed.com, type in belonging and you're going to get thousands of hits because lots of companies And institutions, schools and colleges realize that diversity, equity and inclusion work 
is incomplete if people also don't feel a sense of belonging and community. And so they're changing the names of units. I mean, Harvard just hired a, a dean of belonging, <laughs> you know? And I, I was tempted to take that job description and send it to that first uh, publisher and say, take that. Um, but I did not because um, it gets to the second part of your question. And that is that although, you know, I sort of failed um, at getting that first contract. Um, I overcame it by doing what I've learned is embedded in my belonging work. Um, belonging is a psychological concept. And so in this way, it, it, it connects with so many other concepts like, you know, many in your listening audience will be familiar with Brene Brown's work on vulnerability. It is also a psychological, psycho, psych, social psychological kind of concept similar to belonging. And so we're wired as people, as hu human beings. Listen to that. We're not human. We often, if we, if we, you know, meet each other, we say, hey, Jeff, hey, Ray, how are you? First question we ask is, what do you do? But we're not actually human doings. We're human beings. Um, so that's why I appreciate the question of, you know, the opening question. Tell us about who you are, a little bit about what you do, connecting my being with what I do. But we are preoccupied in this society with what people do, not how we be, <laughs> uh, if you'll allow me to use some broken English there. So I think that um, we're wired to often think about um, and internalize experiences as saying something about who we are as a person universally across times. So, you know, one rejection from one publisher means that I am rejected is how we interpret it. Um, we fail. This happens a lot with students. They fail a quiz and now they see themselves as a failure to the point of your question. Good leaders fail. So lots of leaders fail a lot, but I hope that leaders will fail forward and see failure as just another experience to try again, learn from it, make incremental progress, ultimately on route to success. But when we take failure and allow the avalanche of thoughts to happen that start to um, see it as a long-term indictment against our abilities, to see it as a final assessment of our capabilities, um, then we stop trying. And so I didn't do that. I short-circuited that dirty thinking of, oh my goodness, my ideas are bad. This idea has no value and no worth. Um, I, you know, my ideas don't matter. People won't see value in this. And I replaced it with better thoughts like, well, what can I take from this? Okay, this is good. All right. So clearly I need to um, strengthen talking about the empirical base that informs this work. I need to understand that most people will hear sense of belonging and they'll think warm and fuzzy. They won't think that there's an empirical base to support this. So how can I use this to sharpen my argument for um, why this book is important to do and it's important now and the fact that um, these are some things over which we have control. It's not just talking about belonging, but there are things that we can then do practically in the classrooms, on the campuses that will foster belonging and lead to success. I use that, you know, what would have been seen by some as failure and um, rewired, rethought my uh, thinking, used it, that feedback is constructive um, enhanced my proposal, kept going and pitched it to another publisher who saw the value, who ultimately gave me the book contract that led to the first edition of the book. The book is now in its second edition and it's still picking up steam. I'll close by saying this in the middle of all of this, as if it was not, you know, bad enough as it was to, um, have to manage that. I also experienced the, um, loss of my maternal grandmother. And my maternal grandmother helped raise me. Uh, she is a major animating force of my life. Um, and I experienced her loss, her passing, as yet another form of failure. It's like this light of my world was no longer there with me. And on top of that, I still had to go to work. I still had to write. I still had to teach students. I still had a, a lot of demands on me. And, um, and there were times where I just 
ran out of bandwidth and I didn't want to do the things that I knew I had to do. Um, and the way that I managed that was I did exactly what I talked about earlier. I learned the power of, um, you know, this was before Brene Brown's um, TED talk on it, but I learned the power of vulnerability, talking to people about where I am and how I was doing. Um, the power of grace and that the same way that I extended grace to people as a professor um, and, you know, my students would sometimes miss deadlines because they had a whole lot going on in their world. I needed to be transparent and vulnerable and honest with the people in my universe to know that I am not 100 right now. Um, I miss my grandmother and I don't want to sit at the computer and write. I'd rather um, grieve her loss. I'd rather spend time with my mom, who is an only child who just lost the love of her life. And I need extensions on turning this book around to you. Um, and that I promise to give you good writing. Um, and I promise to give you good work, but it won't come right now. So the same way that I'm asking for this period of grace um, and I give it to others, I learn how to ask for it for myself. I'll close there to say that that's another way that I sort of manage those failures and transitions. So many good pieces of that. You know, it's interesting. I, I have so many different elements that that I think are worth diving deeper into or exploring for our listeners. Like truly, this was a beautiful moment to rewind and, and listen to sections, really think through them, be reflective. I do want to ask you, though, if you had to pick one piece of advice, and I know that one sounds like a joke because I really, I mean, I know you have hundreds of thousands, but if you had to pick one piece of advice for educators listening, what would be the one piece of advice that you would give them in this episode? Um, you know, I think their one piece of advice that I would um, give educators, particularly who are listening to this episode is, you know, and I, again, I could go a lot of different ways, but to just understand the power of belonging, um, people feel like they belong when they feel like they matter and they feel like they matter according to most of our research. Um, when they experience one of four different kinds of, uh, sensations. And I don't mean that just in the, in the, in the space of feelings, although I realize that's where it's going to resonate with a lot of people. Um, but, you know, people feel like they matter when they feel like they're important and they play an important role or they have your attention. Anybody in your listening audience knows what it's like to talk to somebody who's texting on their phone and you feel invisible and you're telling them, you know, really deep insights. And they're just so into their gadget that you feel like, you know, um, you don't have their attention. Well, that's not um, really, most people don't want that sensation, that feeling. People feel like they belong and they feel like they matter. They feel like they matter when they feel important and that they play an important role, that they have your attention, that people need them and that they are a part of the group. And when people care about them, it's that old adage that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So to the people who are listening in this episode, if you're trying to, I don't care what it is, if you're trying to increase student success, if you're trying to help your students make it through this pandemic, if you're trying to you know, connect more meaningfully with your teacher colleagues, or if you're a principal listening and you're trying to boost morale in your school in this pandemic um, and you know, chart a future that's brighter than this most recent past, my advice to you is use belonging as the lens. Make people feel like they belong. And the answers are importance, attention, dependence, and what we call ego extension. That is that you care about people just as much as you care about yourself. And now you got to then do the hard work. And that is get people into a room and think through, okay, how do I do it? For some of you, it's it's meetings, it's the emails, it's the personalized notes, it's the personalized feedback on assignments. For other people, it's the pay raises and the benefits. And the, I mean, there are lots of different ways that given who we are and where we are at the district level, school level, classroom level, what we can do to signal that, you know, people have your attention to care about. But that's my best advice. Just 
un- never underestimate the power of belonging. Listen, I've given talks about it and then people come to me, t- you know, crying their eyeballs out because it just resonates so powerfully with it. I just gave a talk a little bit about belonging at my own institution at a leadership retreat. And at the end, people are sobbing and crying about it. And they're not sobbing and crying because um, of my speech being so great or because my stories are so um, powerful and vulnerable. Although sometimes there are moments like that. They're doing it because I, it's what I said to that first publisher who told me that they didn't see the value is that belonging is a universal concept. Everybody wants to belong. We've known that since the days of Abraham Maslow. It's that when you say it, that matter of fact to people, they're like, oh my gosh, yes, I want to belong. And yes, I want to feel cared about. And it's just so profoundly universal. Um, Don't underestimate the power of it. And don't underestimate the power that you, whoever you are in the listening audience, the power that you have to create belonging for someone else. Hmm. I don't want to underestimate the power you have to create that belonging. That is powerful. Wow. Uh, all right, man. We're going to keep this going. This We're going we're to throw a little challenge at you this time right here, though. We're going to do these next six questions. I'm throwing them at you. Your goal is to answer each one in 15 seconds or less. Are you ready? I'm ready. Oh, my gosh. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Deep what breath. is one ed tech tool you cannot live without? Um, right now it's Calendly because I'm trying to manage my calendar without, uh, help. Uh, give us a book you're reading right now. Right now I'm reading the book Leadership Agility. Who do we need to follow on Twitter or Instagram today? Um, so I think that I would welcome anybody to follow, uh, me, not because, um, I'm so great, but because I could connect you to other people who I follow. So that's TL Strayhorn on all things social media. I think a second person who I would say, um, that I would follow is I follow, you know, you got to keep up with the world. So I try to follow, um, one of the education news sources, whether it's the Chronicle or whether it's, um, educate, there are lots of those that you could do. Um, how many am I supposed to list? Uh, three. Yeah. You can list up three. Yeah. You're good. Yep. So I would say that, and listen, you know, I've talked a lot about, I think kind of real serious things, um, education and the world and all that. Um, but, you know, I think the world is also, particularly right now, looking for some inspiration. And so there is a um, site, Inspiration, that every day will sort of put a motivational thought in your uh, inbox. And so I would encourage you to follow them as well. Awesome. What's a good YouTube channel, website, or podcast educators should check out? Oh, my goodness. So I'm going to probably... Um, share some of the the airtime with you and say that um, in preparation for my time with you all today, checking out your podcast. So if you haven't already, please follow Teach Better Talk podcast. That's a good one to follow. Um, you know, in terms of YouTube channels, let me um, share space with my own university. Um, we have a YouTube channel. It is um, VUU, Virginia Union University TV. So VUU TV on YouTube. YouTube. That's great because it keeps you up with the doings of our university. But every now and again, like we just had Anthony Anderson as our commencement speaker. He spoke there. We've got a pretty impressive um, distinguished lecture series coming out of the Center for the Study of HBCUs. We had Michael Eric Dyson in the fall. So that is also on our YouTube channel. So follow us on the YouTube. And then I think in the terms of a website, um, you know, I've been spending a lot of time looking at um i don't know i don't have another website so maybe it'll hit me later there it is that's all right we got we got the (laughs) channel we got the podcast we're good we're good give us a a a daily a weekly or a monthly routine every teacher should get into daily weekly or monthly um good question uh so let's see i would say daily to schedule your break time um, mm. you know, and, and I mean, put it on your schedule. So that's something that I do. It is something that I ask my deans to do. And it's something that I realize as a provost, um, it's been important for me to model for people. Um, so especially during the pandemic, um, you know, I would 
tell folks, look, it's okay um, to take breaks in the middle of the day, go for a walk, breathe, breathe wear your mask and, and go outside for some sunlight. I don't know. Um, and I don't think people believe me at first, unfortunately, but I think over time people have like, wow, he keeps saying this and he's actually doing it. And when we do it, we don't, you know, he, he supports us and encourages. It. So for people who are listening to this, um, you know, make time for self care, do it daily. Um, and you know, look, I'm not going to prescribe to you. Maybe you're not a walker. You might be a runner. I'm a runner. Maybe it's not running or walking. You need time on a treadmill. Just make time for yourself. I think on a weekly basis, um, I have come to create times. It, it, it was done institutionally for us. We have a thing called Wellness Wednesdays where, um, and it sounds like what we're doing is probably riding a treadmill or riding a bike. It started that way. But actually um, now what it is, it's a time to just check in with people. And so I would say to all of the teachers and the educators and the listening audience, um, you know, community is important. I think what we'll be able to say as a nation at the end of this is that what really got us through the pandemic is, is community, the connectedness. It's interesting, right? As a belonging scholar, um, I wrote a blog about this. We had to be physically distanced because of COVID, but we realized the power of social distance, that although we were physically distanced, we had to be socially connected and we had to figure out ways to use ed technologies and Zoom and, and sit, you know, Snapchat and Instagram, all these things. And, um, you know, I was one who DJ D nice, um, who started having the, um, you know, um, quarantine club, club quarantine, where you could sort of be at home, but sort of like you were in a club listening to music. Um, that was powerful to me as a, as a social psychologist to watch people on a, in a social virtual space, co co reconstruct what it was like to be in a nightclub, you know, to imagine being near the bar though they know that they're not to create their own bar at home, but to feel connected to people. Why am I saying this is because I think these lessons will go with us even after the pandemic, even as outside opens up, listen, we figured out how to use technology and ways to stay connected. So I hope for the teachers um, and the educators in the listening audience that you will create time weekly to check in with others, to see how they're doing, to check in with your students and their families. And so on a monthly basis, I hope that each uh, teacher and educator in the listening audience will um, challenge themselves to learn something new. And I think it's this podcast. Um, Jeff and Ray have done a great job, not just in this episode, but even in previous episodes, asking the guests to name certain podcasts and books and websites. I love when podcast hosts do that, but I've always wondered how many people in the listening audience actually go and pick up the book or try the thing. So I'm, I'm encouraging those who will listen to this episode, you know, create your own curriculum. Listen, we're teachers. We know how to do this. We create curriculum for students, but let's create it for ourselves. You know, find the books, find the technology. Um, the one thing I picked up from my grandmother, listen, she was 88 when she died. Uh, my grandmother learned, taught herself how to use a computer. She told me, she said, she never called me Terrell. She called me Rail. She said, hey, Rail, I want a computer. So we got her a computer. And one day she said, now, honey, I, I want to learn how to use this internet. And so I was teaching my 80, what, 87 year old grandmother, uh, how to use the internet. And I, and I walked her through the steps. And I can honestly say my grandmother purchased a dress, a white dress. I can see it in my mind right now. Um, from JC Penney's on the internet. She was so proud um, that Sunday that she wore her dress to church. And I thought she looked beautiful in it. I'm sure that's part of the proud, the pride, but I could listen to her conversation with her peers because they would say, oh, my grandmother's, you know, they would call her Miss Criola. She, they would say, Miss Criola, oh, I love that dress. And she would say, honey, I bought this dress on the internet. And it was that sense of accomplishment, right? That she, even in her late eighties, had learned another skill as a master teacher um, that led her to accomplish some new skill. She had never done it before. Um, and little did I know, seeing her that Easter, that that would be our last Easter together. Um, and I'm so glad that um, she was able to purchase the dress before that happened. Um, so to those of you in the listening audience, you know, seize the opportunity now. Go back through the episodes, grab the books, and challenge yourself, if not monthly, 
bi-monthly, every two months, you're learning something new. You're figuring out how to use some new technology. You're figuring out how to, you know, um, read. You know, I love Carol Dweck's book, Mindset. If you haven't added that to the list, add it, go read it. She gives us good feedback, good insights about how to offer growth-minded, constructive feedback to our students. But most importantly, listen, every day, practice self-care. Every week, check in with other people. But every month, learn something new. You know, Terrell, there was so many good pieces of this. I am so excited for everyone to get access to this episode and listen to it three, four, five, six times in a row because holy moly, is that valuable. Terrell, I know you're on every social media platform possible, so I hope that everybody goes and hunts you down. We'll also have all that information in the show notes. Jeff, you ready to take us out? Let's do it. Yes, you know you can find all the information, all the links, and everything we talk about in this episode over at teachbetter.com, as well as the links for connecting with Terrell and keeping the conversation going with him. So make sure you head over there and get everything at teachbetter.com for that. Make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss upcoming episodes. And if you can give us a rating and review, we'd really appreciate that as well. Terrell, this was awesome, man. There is so, so, so much value throughout this episode. So, so grateful that you were able to join us, that you were able to take some time and to share all your experiences with us, man. Thank you so, so much. My pleasure. Thank you both. Until next time, let's get out there and let's teach better.